This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. There's so much rich information embedded in the histologic and molecular features of tissue which can be extracted through digital pathology. We seem to be at the convergence of AI, image analysis, and precision medicine. Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. We're talking with Jonathan Daniels and Ori Zelikoff from Nuclei, who are committed to bringing the power of spatial biology to reality by providing pharmaceutical companies and clinicians with AI-powered image analysis applications. We're going to be talking about the promise of digital pathology and image analysis and how these technologies can be leveraged in drug discovery and ultimately in patient care. What does the future hold? And how does a higher throughput of patient biopsies through a digital pathology system result in a new age of information and discovery analogous to the revolution we've seen in sequencing the human genome? We'll talk about the rich ecosystem in medtech in Israel and what makes nuclei unique in its makeup and approach. Today's podcast is sponsored by Motic Digital Pathology. Creating the systems that move pathology forward. Jonathan Daniels and Ori Zelikoff from Nuclei, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, having us. It sounds like you have a lot going on and a lot is relevant to digital pathology and companion diagnostics. Jonathan, maybe first tell us a little bit about the history of Nuclei and this unique team you're building and, and the unique experience they bring to the table. At Nuclei, we're building a precision medicine company that's focused on unlocking the potential of spatial biology by leveraging some of the greatest uh, advancements in machine learning and AI as it relates to digital pathology. We started the company about four years ago. It's headquartered in Tel Aviv in Israel, and we also have expanded out here in the U.S. in Chicago. The history of the team is actually quite unique in the sense that um, it's a combination of AI experts, machine learning experts, computer vision experts, and also others across uh, pathology, science, uh, and commercialization. And CEO and founding team, Avi Weidman, Latan, and, and Eli Rohn, uh, actually all served together in the Israeli intelligence forces, you know, anywhere ranging from 10 to 20 years. Um, and our CEO, Avi, was responsible for operationalizing and scaling AI computer vision tools for satellite image analysis. The team kind of took that uh, expertise in finding unique signatures and uh, coordinates in aerial images and applied that to pathology images. The goal was to find a, a new way to impact the world and impact, you know, an area that really could be disrupted. And so that was the origination of Nuclei. And so, you know, four years later, we've, we've grown the business and the company to about 30 people and are partnering with some of the leading pharma companies and healthcare companies in, in driving precision medicine and, and really changing the way AI is, is applied to pathology. That's a great story. I think we're hearing more and more about Israel being such a hotbed in med tech, artificial intelligence, software development. I, it's fascinating how it's such a hotbed, and I know you have this rich, rich ecosystem and can develop partnerships. There's great databases with the healthcare providers. We're hearing similar stories. After all, what we're looking at at some level is images, and so it doesn't necessarily matter the, the background the team comes from, but I think intelligence, military applications of, of image analysis, whatever they may be, often lend, lend themselves in a unique way to healthcare. And of course, we can't do it in a vacuum. It requires a multidisciplinary approach. So we need engineers, software developers, as well as the medical input. And of course, operationalizing this is a big task. So maybe tell us a little bit about the platform you've developed, how it works, what goes into it, and then what your approach is to take your platform and then develop, develop tools to help doctors and patients. And one thing I'll add to your characterization of the you know, Israeli startup environment and ecosystem is that you know, there is a rich, very rich talent pool of people that have worked in you know, high pressure situations with very real results that they needed to produce. That mentality and that experience really transfers well to the healthcare ecosystem where we're dealing with patient lives, with uh, drug development and with other similar important and life-changing uh, activities. And so Culturally and, and from an ecosystem standpoint, uh, we know we're very fortunate to have been tapped into that uh, arena. More specifically around, you know, nuclei and kind of what we're up to and what we're building, really our goal in general is to develop 
technology that can serve both pharmaceutical companies to help them to develop drugs, all the way to com companion diagnostics and tools in the hands of physicians to help them make better treatment decisions. Given that we are a startup company and, and that we have to kind of prioritize and, and the ecosystem of pharma and cl clinic is quite large, we've actually chosen to apply our technology at, at the moment to the pharma drug development process. And so what does that look like? It, it really kind of starts with building AI machine learning models that can take pathology images, H&E, IHC, multiplex images, structure and characterize the tissue and cell architecture from these images. So whether it's tumor, stroma, necrosis areas, or different cell types or immune cell classifications, we actually can go develop models that, that can identify these things. And from, from this, we actually are then able to take it a step further and take a computational approach that calculates spatial features and relationships between the tissues, the cells, how populated certain immune cells are within the TME or within the tumor, and, and things of that nature. And so what those spatial features allow you to do is start to find kind of these novel biomarkers, or this new age of digital biomarkers that can potentially predict response to therapy, be prognostic markers, or even maybe predict uh, genomic mutations in patients. And so our platform, you know, includes this kind of image analysis and structuring engine, which is made available to our pharma partners in a software service and package. And then we, we usually will combine the, the image analysis results with clinical data or outcomes data, genomics data to build multivariate models that can predict response and, and you know, show the Kaplan-Meyers and the improvement of those patients if they have the, a certain biomarker or combination of biomarkers or not. I think we're entering into very interesting times, a, a new golden age perhaps of personalized medicine because I think a lot of forces are coming together. With the advent of precision medicine or personalized medicine, the goal of course is to get the right drugs to the right patients at the right time, kind of moving out of what I call the stone age, right? The one size fits all approach. There's a lot of different ways you can go about uh, targeting therapies and developing companion diagnostics. Now we have roughly 40 or so targeted agents or approvals with companion diagnostics now, but most of them have been based on molecular tools or maybe IHC. But now I think the timing is right for computational pathology and image analysis in this kind of approach. So how did you choose this model of choosing to partner with pharma? What we've realized is that pharma obviously is the breeding grounds for some of the new age of therapies uh, and cutting edge technologies. And when evaluating kind of the uptake of computational pathology as it relates to treating patients, our thinking was, you know, this is where we can really improve at the base level, potentially starting in pharma, using our technology to find the biomarkers and then develop them as companion diagnostics. Once those diagnostics are approved and are on the market with the, you know, the associated drug, of course, there will be an adoption. We're, we're thinking there's a more likely chance of adoption from the broader physician research community. So that was kind of the initial thinking. And from there, we started to test that hypothesis with a very large set of, of different pharma companies. And we realized that the, the need is, is very much so there. There are a lot of IO trials specifically that might not have the right efficacy or might look at responders and non-responders and, and not even be able to understand why those patients are responding in certain ways. And so this spatial biology approach in pharma has unlocked a new data modality for pharma to assess. You know, there was genomics, proteomics, et cetera, and now we're bringing a new modality to the table. Our focus isn't in our tech is really not about replacing pathologists or even necessarily just giving them tools to do their job better, but really augmenting some of the work that pathologists can do and partnering with pathologists to find things that can't necessarily be seen with the human eye and now you know, providing them with a computational approach to pathology. An interesting partnership because historically, drug manufacturers want to have blockbusters. They want to sell as much of their drug as possible to the broadest audience or broadest group of patients as possible. But we're learning that one size fits all doesn't work, or really we could do better. One example, because it's so obvious, would be Keytruda and these new immune checkpoint inhibitors, which I think has roughly 26 approvals, depending on how you count. The companion diagnostic is a simple IHC marker scored manually by a human being, a pathologist looking in the microscope, basically counting the number of cells that turn brown. 
for lack of a better description. I think we all know or we all hope or suspect that there's got to be a better way to do it. Specifically, do you have interest in the immune oncology space or do you have a broader approach to various disease types and therapies? I think this is a great transition for Ori to go into the work we're doing in IO. Digital pathology and especially like spatial pathology has multiple different applications. We have the ability really to tackle different areas, including immune oncology, obviously, but also autoimmune disease, diseases like NASH and IBD. The focus we have on IO and immune oncology is mostly first because we, we see how big is the need there. You know, you talked about the one-size-fits-all approach. We understand that this approach is, is not sustainable in immune oncology. Uh, immune oncology drugs are becoming like the backbone of the cancer treatment. And we see kind of expansion in approvals, not only to other cancer types, but all, also to earlier cancer stages. Those pharma companies that do want to expand the market and to capture the market, they cannot afford it to take those drugs into clinical trials with uh, all comers approach because in stage two, stage three diseases, many of the patients can uh, survive without any additional or adjuvant drug. They will have to prove for the FDA and then for the reimbursement purposes that they really know how to choose the patient that really benefit from those drugs. So I think that the need in identifying patients' biomarkers for immune oncology is really huge. So this is where we focus in and also the, the importance of spatial biology in identifying patients who are sensitive to those drugs is uh, well established in, in scientific literature today. Immune oncology is definitely a hot area and very, very promising, and I think it really lends itself to digital pathology. But you said something interesting about other types of disease. I think cancer gets a lot of the focus, maybe some would say a disproportionate amount of the focus in terms of developing companion diagnostics and so on. But I think immune oncology, the principles involved can kind of start to blend and be involved with autoimmune diseases and inflammatory conditions as well. So Ori, do you think there's a future there, or perhaps an untapped area of focus? Absolutely. We look at NASH as some of the, the major kind of clinical trials currently have failed to show the required efficacy that the burden of disease is, 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 is huge. And we start to see some signs that really analyzing uh, biopsies of, of NASH patients could kind of stratify, better stratify the patients and allow you to choose the right patients to this kind of novel drugs. I think that would be a major area of advance in, in spatial biology. Now, specifically, maybe could you tell us how this works in the real world or maybe some instances that you've used your technology and, and applied it to immune oncology? The idea that you can analyze the TME, the tumor microenvironment, and capture the different spatial interactions of the cells within the tumor and the TME and actually predict response to immunotherapy is not obvious. When we started working on this product, we realized we must prove in a very convincing way that we can do that. So we have just recently um, presented the first biomarker discovery study work in ASCO 2021, unfortunately virtually, uh, showing very encouraging results. What we did there was a retrospective analysis of more than 90 patients from two different medical centers in Israel that were treated with pembrolizumab. So the cohort was composed of non-small cell lung cancer patients. All of them were stage four, treated first line single agent pembro. And we were kind of trying to understand whether we can identify patients who are exceptional responders to Keytruda. So we split the cohort to a training set from one center and a validation set from another center. And again, we got an access to both clinical data, which means clinical outcome data, as well as all the potential confounders like smoking status and ego performance, and also genomic data, and as well as obviously the pre-treatment biopsies. And we use the age and E biopsies, the standard age and E stainings for the analysis. And what we did basically is to generate a very large amount of spatial features out of every age and E slide. Now we got, you know, for each patient, very simple kind of features like quantification of TILs or tumor cells. 
to the more advanced spatial features like proximity or densities of different cell population. And then we use our deep learning algorithm to kind of classify patients to patients with durable clinical benefit to those that kind of were more resistant to the treatment. We were very surprised to see a model that were able in a very accurate way to distinguish between patients that were sensitive and patients that were insensitive to the treatment. And after testing this model on an independent validation cohort, we were able to show that patients that had a positive score of the nuclei test had a significantly higher median OS, one in OS and two year OS over patients that had a negative score based on our spatial analysis. And those kind of scorings and the differences between those patients were really independent of pdl one score. So it was a kind of a proof of concept that analyzing the spatial arrangement of cells in the TME can really add over the pdl one scorings. That's kind of along the lines of what I was getting at. I think we suspect there's so much more rich information there than a simple IHC marker. So I think this is proof of concept that we're right, that there is information there and that we can mine this information using your approach and come up with viable tools. Give us a hint of what this might look like in actual practice. You know, what is this going to mean for the pathologist who's interpreting a biopsy for a patient with lung cancer? So first, I'd like to say that this kind of product or study, we aim it first to the pharma companies. So we use the real world data to generate this kind of models, but I think this is allowing us to use the same understanding of the tumor microenvironment and the mechanisms of action to now take the same models and to apply them for, you know, phase two clinical trials with immuno-oncology drugs that are now under development. And using the real world data really gives us advantage, all the pharma partners we work with an advantage because they can work with data that were collected independently, uh, models that were more generalizable and that can uh, provide more insights into the trials that pharma companies work on. So that's uh, the first advantage of those real world data generated models. Uh, now I think regarding your question, first we really working hard not to develop biomarkers that are black box because we understand that down the road the physicians that prescribe the drugs and the regulator that approve those drugs want to understand why did we classify one patient as a responder versus another patient as a non-responder. So all of those features that we are generating and afterwards including in our models are human interpretable. So once we found a biomarker we can definitely guide for some of the features, obviously, the pathologist in how to quantify or how to measure or at least validate that this feature is really, you know, positive or negative to the specific patient, and then to integrate those features into a scoring that can guide the oncologist to whether the drug should be or shouldn't be uh, prescribed based on our analysis. That's ultimately the question at some point down the road, right? How can we have tools that say, should or should not this patient get the drug or how likely are they to do? And then with that information, the treating physician can make the, the, most, in, the most informed decision. What's the future hold for nuclei? What's, what's the long-term plan? How are we going to incorporate this great technology into developing new companion diagnostics, new drugs, and advancing patient care? Sure. The long-term plan is to be the leader of spatial biology and, and AI and pathology, and applying these technologies and systems broadly. You know, like I mentioned earlier, both to pharma and to clinicians. From a commercialization standpoint, we see ourselves partnering with some of the leading digital pathology and, and diagnostics companies that are implemented and, and scaled, you know, internationally and globally, where many doctors and you know, pathologists, oncologists are interacting with these pre-existing or pre-integrated uh, technology solutions. And so, you know, we could become a software application on top of that and be deployed at scale. We've also thought about serving in some capacity as a central lab where we are actually receiving and integrating with these large centers via cloud-based, you know, integrations and can run this analysis and provide it back to the pathologist and oncologist uh, in a very quick manner. The story, you know, will continue to develop, you know, as we move from pharma, you know, development, you know, discovery 
to you know really scaling and powering hundreds of studies across pharma in the next two, three, four years. And as we scale and continue to uh, find more uh, biomarkers and more interesting insights, those will start to translate into companion diagnostics and eventually getting into the hands uh, of physicians and, and really driving improved response to patients. That's a lot, a lot to think about. I think the future is certainly very interesting and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But on behalf of pathologists, you know, I got to ask, what is the future going to look like for us in terms of being the physicians behind the scenes, giving this information to the treating physicians about what therapies their patients should be on there? I think you mentioned the possibility of like a centralized laboratory type arrangement. And I think historically in pathology, there's always been a push and pull between being able to do things locally versus having to do them centrally for whatever reasons it's too complex or the scale of the operation wouldn't wouldn't make sense. But I think you, you mentioned with cloud computing, it opens up whole new possibilities, being able to do things centrally, so to speak, or in the cloud, even maybe. So maybe just give us a taste of what the future might look like for the practicing pathologist using these tools. We are not trying to automate anything that the pathologists are doing today, right? Obviously not want to replace any pathologies, but just to give more insights regarding the biology of the tumor to the pathology. So if today you have the molecular pathology, you can extract genomics out of the tissue and you can extract, you know, PD-1 expression or HER2 expression out of the slide, we will provide more insights into the pathology, the biology, the mechanisms of action of the immune system that can allow you to better understand what you see and how to guide the treating physicians in uh, choosing the right treatment. Now, I think that a central lab versus the idea of you know, deploying the biomarker to the lab is, is a good question. I think in, in our case, the limiting factor is really the scanners, because as, as you mentioned, cloud computing is pretty easy to deploy, and I believe this is the ideal model for us. But eventually, I think that when we see more and more scanners being the standard, within medical centers, it would be pretty uh, easier for us to go and to allow you to access or to upload the image to the cloud and to get immediately the results out of those. Um, I think it will really allow the pathologist to have more information and to be more involved in guiding the treatment and eventually bring more precise medicines to, to cancer patients and other patients worldwide. Our pathologist listeners will be very excited to hear that, to be more involved and to help bring more precise treatments to patients. So Ori and Jonathan, uh, th thank you so much. So you certainly must have competitors. I think we're all focused, highly focused on this uh, field of digital pathology and computational pathology and developing new tools and companion diagnostics. So what makes Nuclei unique? We actually have a, a series of advantages that have allowed us to you know, not just be a leader in this space, but also to uh, continue to push the bounds and the boundaries for, you know, what AI and pathology will look like in the future. And, and, you know, I would say the three or the two or three main prongs are the first being our strategy in general is really focused on starting in pharma and progressing into the clinic. And I, and I think there are some companies focused more on building tools for pathologists kind of clinical setting. And then there are other companies that are more focused on advancing biomarkers and companion diagnostics. So I think that's the first kind of split and difference. You know, from there, we then have a significant uh, data advantage where we've partnered with major cancer centers um, and medical centers, both in Israel and the United States, um, to access a large amount of their or almost all of their data. And that's not just pathology images or slides, but also clinical data, genomics data, radiomics data. Uh, and proteomics data, really everything from retrospective to prospective. And as we've seen in, in the, you know, kind of the, the, the times of COVID um, with Pfizer vaccinations and the Israeli, you know, data sets and readouts, you know, the, the centralized nature uh, and ecosystem of, of Israeli uh, data has really allowed us to not just access the data, but also um, receive it in a structured way that, uh, that can, uh, you know, be molded and analyzed at scale. And so, you know, what does this data advantage really mean for us? It means a few things. One, um, we're able to, you know, build and, and actually develop some of our, uh, mostly our own pre-trained uh, algorithms and models that are independent of, you know, our partner's data sets. So that's, you know, we're, we're, we don't rely on pharma 
uh, to be able to, to, to drive and build our technology. Uh, but also, um, our models are very generalizable. Uh, and and what, what that really says is, is, you know, capturing the heterogeneity of the data across many medical centers, different locations, different staining types and methods. And so between those two, um, you know, we believe it, it, it allows us to, you know, build a product that scales over time and also, uh, you know, provide some of the, you know, the highest quality, um, you know, metrics and, and insights into spatial biology. Jonathan and Ori, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Now, tell us a little bit about yourselves. I'm sure our, our listeners, after hearing all about nuclei, I think our listeners might want to get a little insight into you. So maybe uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests in digital pathology. I'm a physician by training. I studied medicine in, here in Israel, did my internship in Tel Aviv Medical Center, and realized uh, during medical school that I want to work on a, on a more large scale problems and, and to combine my passion for technology. I also served in some of the intelligence technological forces here in Israel and kind of want to, want to combine my, my passion for technology with my will to affect healthcare and kind of move to the industry after the internship to work on companies working in, you know, bioconversions, mainly in oncology. Before Nuclei, I was the medical director for a company named Novells developing precision oncology tools for targeted therapies using functional genomics. And after, you know, moving to nuclei, I was pretty excited. You know, I worked on targeted therapies. And then in nuclei, I saw the opportunity to work on first immuno-oncology that were kind of different. And I found it to be more interesting in terms of targeted therapy that were kind of very mature in terms of the biomarkers, whereas in immuno-oncology, I think the holy grail is really to find a novel biomarker. So that was a really exciting opportunity. And second, genomics, that is something I worked on, is really crowded area. And I, I thought that really the conversions of AI and biology can unlock the rich information, the rich biological information that resides in pathology, in biopsies. And I thought that would be a great opportunity to, you know, to research and to work on really novel areas, both in terms of the, the therapeutics, the, the, the immune oncology drugs, and both in terms of the sensors that are not the genomics, proteomics, but something that is really new, which is the spatial biology and the pathology. Um, you know, I actually have a business background and I got introduced to the healthcare world early on. You know, my dad is a physician. I did a few years actually working with a large variety of pharma and biotech, corporate development and investment banking related uh, types of activities. And then my, I would say that my intro into the precision medicine space was when I joined uh, Tempest about six years ago. I, I was one of the first business hires there and got to really see the evolution and the genomic revolution of a very fast growing company in the space that's that was looking to take large data sets across genomic data, clinical data, pathology data, and try to unlock the insights uh, for those data sets, you know, at scale. And so I actually led the commercialization of Tempest's data set to large pharma for a few years and was able to, uh, you know, find nuclei through the process of really looking for that next cutting edge uh, kind of evolution or revolution. And uh, really the convergence, as Ori mentioned, of AI, with pathology, with precision medicine, is where I see, you know, everything, you know, going. It's a really exciting space for me. It's going to be a, a journey for us all in seeing, you know, how these technologies evolve and get placed in the clinical setting and uh, something I want to be a part of. A lot of forces are coming together at just the right time. And, and I think, interestingly, Tempest really blazed a trail there in terms of the scale at which the amount of money they raised, I guess, first of all, and then the scale and the and the amount of resources they were able to deploy into this area, I think, has really opened up things for a lot of people. And I think we've a lot of us have been the beneficiaries of it. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, so what excites you? Where do you folks see the field headed in the next 10 years or so, Ori? The fact that this is kind of new way of extracting biological data is really exciting. I mean, what I see in the future of digital pathology is once the, the industry is, is scaling and, and becoming more mature, I expect to see more and more scanners, just like, you know, the Illumina machines uh, that were deployed and more and more uh, genomes were sequenced. I expect to see more and more biopsies to be scanned and more and more biopsies uh, scanned, meaning we will have more data available 
a better understanding of spatial biology. And the way I envision it is that, you know, once a cancer patient and any kind of patient is going through a biopsy as becoming to a clinic, you will not only have biopsy histological data and genomic data and, you know, his blood test, but also a spatial biology data that will be like an integral part of the, you know, the EMR and the way that physicians really prescribe, diagnose and treat those patients. And I hope this would be kind of the backbone of the, the precision medicine uh, 10 years from now. Establishing the backbone for precision medicine. Jonathan, how about you? What excites you? Yeah, I think Ori mentioned a lot of the, the key points there, but what, what I would add is also how important it is to accelerate some of the work that's being done in precision medicine, whether it's sequencing and getting those turnaround times down, or whether it's applying digital pathology AI solutions and getting back results to physicians and pathologists in a very short order. So I think as it relates to uh, nuclei and our technology, you know, some of the work that we're doing and a lot of it is, is actually based on the H&E and H&Es are available everywhere. And so, uh, you know, we, I like to imagine a world where the H&E can tell uh, a huge part of the story. Slides are uploaded and results, spatial results are, are received in a matter of minutes. Or, or hours rather than, you know, even days. You know, just giving physicians tools that are scalable and also can get the patients their treatments as soon as possible, I think is really important. Pathologists would be gratified to hear that. The H&E can tell a large part of the story. That's wonderful. Well, our guests have been Jonathan Daniels and Ori Zelikoff from Nuclei. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. <music> This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.